Holy Spirit, come to us. Veni Sancte Spiritus. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes to us, things can get really scary before they get really holy. In the context of Luke's gospel, things were starting to get really scary for Jesus. People, clever people, political, powerful people were plotting to kill him. And Jesus, I believe, knew it and stayed the course anyway because he had already faced his fear and was liberated from it. And as Luke tells us, it came to pass when the days were near that he should, he, Jesus, should be taken up. He intently set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so the journey continues. Here are reading from Luke's gospel, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, Go tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But you are not willing. See, your house is left to you. I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds. Please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle us in the fire of your holy love. Send forth your spirit that we may all be renewed and together through you, we shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. If y'all wouldn't mind, I'm having some trouble breathing and my glasses are getting fogged. If I could just take off my mask for today, thank you. <laughs> it's a scary world, isn't it? All of us are very mindful of what's happening in Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia, the people of Europe. We're mindful of the threat that exists around the whole world. And for us, even, we're mindful of the bizarre and irresponsible actions of some people in our own country. We're mindful that the leader of Russia seems to have reason left behind. He's lost his reason and there's danger to the world. And when we focus a little closer on our daily lives, I think there's just as much confusion. The mask mandates are starting to lift. Things are changing and we're still not sure what we're supposed to do. We're trying to be careful. We're trying to do what's right. 
How do we even know what's coming out of this long, dark, fearful time that we've been living in? And as we emerge, we emerge into another dark and fearful time and we think that it's unrelenting. When are we gonna get some relief? And then we come to church and it's Lent. (laughs) And we've got to talk about sin and fear and chicks fleeing from being devoured by wolves. And a mother hen, like savior, trying to protect us with her very body. Today's story has such sadness. Jesus's lament over Jerusalem, I think it's one of the saddest stories in all the gospels. A story of a mother, a vulnerable mother, bereft, mourning for her chicks that she longs to protect from the cunning and brutal foxes out there. It's sadness right up there with Jesus weeping over the death of his beloved friend, Lazarus. Jesus on the cross weeping after he bids his mother farewell for the last time. Or Jesus rearing back when Judas leans toward him on the night of his arrest. Must you betray me with a kiss? There's such sorrow in these stories, such crushing disappointment in how things turned out in spite of Jesus's higher vision for them, his life's labor on their behalf and ours. In the case of Lazarus, Jesus intervenes. He brings his friend back to life. But in these other cases, he's so much more like us. He laments over a city that kills people like him before and seems bent on doing it again. On the night of his arrest, he watches the police push Judas aside. Then he stops his friends from trying to save him by force. No more of this, he says when one pulls out a sword and cuts off a trooper's ear? Because the trooper's not the enemy. The sword is the enemy. And in case anyone misses the point, Jesus heals the man's ear. And then he holds out his hands like in handcuffs, as it were, turning his face to the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. It's not just a sad story, it's a scary story. At least for those who claim Jesus as their exemplar. I mean, if he's the one we're meant to emulate, then the implications are terrifying. Open your wings to people who mean to kill you. Heal the hurt of a guy who's come to arrest you. Stop your friends from treating an armed posse like the enemy when that's clearly how they see you. I think the foxes are busy raiding the chicken coop all over the world. The obvious one these days is Putin surrounding the people of Ukraine as millions flee the country as Ukrainian president and former comedian Zelensky clad in his khakis, refuses to flee, but stands his ground instead to protect his flock with the vulnerability of a mother hen. It's easy for us to be filled with fear as we watch millions fleeing that country, as maternity wards are bombed, as parents are separated from young children, while thousands of others fight bravely, propped up by military equipment from NATO. It's easy to be filled with visions of violence and retaliation, not only against Putin, but against the Russian oligarchs, the Russian military, against the military industrial complex, against the fossil fuel industry, and all of its profound influence on geopolitical foreign policy. It's easy for us to demonize and make generalizations, and it's hard for us to stop doing it. 
once we succumb to this us, them, inside, outside, othering, belonging, you're with us or against us kind of thinking that binary, either or black and white, all good, all evil, that kind of rhetoric that takes over and possesses us. It literally possesses us in these stressful, violent, polarizing times. And so it's easy for us to be outraged, incensed at this assault upon, our de upon democracy and united in an unholy hatred against them, united in our common hatred of what we fear in this ever more polarized country. And I think sadly in doing so, we lose our soul as a country, as a people, because we lose our sense of who we are and what we love and the love that unites us. And sadly, it is all too human. And even worse, this tendency focuses our attention away from the fox-like violent assault on the democracy in this country and the most vulnerable chicks right here at home. If you remember before the 2016 election, the refrain throughout time was, our government is broken and no one seems able to fix it. Or the modern paraphrase of today's parable, Washington, Washington, the city that neuters its politicians and throws stones at those elected to it. I don't think Jesus has a solution for the foxes in Washington or in Moscow any more than he had a solution for Jerusalem. But I do think he has a word for those of us who are ripe for our own lament of what we have become. We have become filled with fear, fear of survival, fear of not having enough, fear of those who disagree with us, fear of those who are different from us. And I think these were the very things that Jesus faced in that wilderness. He faced his own internal fears so that he could be liberated from them so he could live with courage, full of love. And so we too must face our fears, our internalized, unexamined, repressed fears. Why? Because unexamined fears have a way of manifesting, don't they? They can become internalized, they can make us sick, or they can, as, in, as despair, as sorrow, as depression, or they can become externalized. Unexamined fear can divide us, isolate us, instill violence, destroy community. It can scatter the chicks in the coop. It can make us more vulnerable to the foxes that threaten their lives. Unexamined fear is a threat to democracy, to community, to our existence. And yes, to the chicken coop. Consider how these dynamics play out in local editor letters to the editors. Any of you read them? The mounting fear of those who are different, the tendency to demonize those who are different, who differ from us, who disagree with us, to create sly and cunning conspiracies about how sinister they are and how we must stop them by any means, including violence. And so back to this gospel, this good news, and specifically with the conviction, the religious conviction that everyone, every single one of us is created good, created in the image of God, created as very good, Political historian Heather Cox Richardson in her daily reflection yesterday writes a little bit of US history. The founders of this country and the concept that all men were created equal and had a right to consent to the government under which they lived, the heart of the Declaration of Independence was revolutionary. For all that it excluded, Indigenous Americans, black colonists, and all women 
the very idea that men were not born into a certain caste, a certain place in a hierarchy and could create a government that reflected such an idea upended traditional Western beliefs. It was radical. But from the very beginning at the very same time, there were plenty of Americans who doubled down on the idea of human hierarchies in which a few superior men, white property owners, should rule the rest. They argued that the constitution was designed to protect property alone and that a few men accumulated wealth and they should run things, a republic. And I think Heather goes on to say, I think that now once again, we are at an inflection point. The rise of global oligarchs, the internet, which enables those oligarchs to spread disinformation has made a significant number of American voters once again, slide away from democracy to embrace the idea that the country would work better with a few leaders making rules for the rest of us. The sobering reality is that in 19 states, Republican dominated legislatures have passed laws that restrict the vote and entrench minority rule, even up to allowing state legislators to have passed laws that restrict the vote and entrench minority view to overrun election results. And if that is permitted to stand, that minority can choose a president and it is increasingly backing one single man, one individual to rule over the rest of us. If history is any guide, she concludes, we are at the point when voters of all parties must push back to say that we do in fact believe in the principles stated in the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal and that our government is legitimate only if we have a say in it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Washington, Washington, Moscow, Moscow, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. If anyone ever had reason to hurl invective, to take aim against the enemy, it was Jesus. Jesus did not invent the conspiracy against him. His opponents identified him as the problem, the real and present threat to their safety, the manifest source of all their woes. His enemies did not doubt their logic. Their certainty was their strength. And so they supported one another in drawing a target over his head with no reservations about taking aim. And what did he do? What did Jesus do? He opened his wings. He healed the hurt of an arresting officer. He kept falling for the image of God. I'm not saying I could do any of those things or that any one of us could do anything like that in the same situation. But perhaps we could handle conflicts without drawing targets on each other's heads. And perhaps we could consciously presume the goodness of one another. So if that doesn't convince you about the complete impracticality about the Christian gospel, I don't know what will. But if you are looking for a truly transformative Lenten discipline, Here's a pretty good one. Presume goodness in other people. Put away your sword. Face your inner fears that move you toward violence and isolation and despair. And keep opening your wings to the image of God in friends, in strangers, in enemies, and especially within yourself, just until Easter.
then you can give it all up. Since the one we follow in the ways of love will be right there clucking at us and with us, looking like a safer bet than any fox we've ever feared, because we're all in this together. Amen.